Since Arsenal d- decided not to turn up on Wednesday night, Elliot has decided not to turn up on Thursday. This is the Arsenal Vision Post-Match Podcast with your host for this episode, Tim Stillman. That's right, Elliot threw in the towel, looked at one look at the performance at London Stadium on Wednesday night, and he said, if the players aren't turning up, I'm not turning up. So I'm here to pick up the pieces like a prime Jorginho um, and distribute in front of the back four. Uh, and with me, pretty tortured analogy, but forgive me, <laughs> with me to pick over the the bones, the carcass, the corpse of last night's game is Clive, who you can follow on Twitter at Clive PAFC. Hi, Clive. Hello, hello. See, Elliot rotated himself out nicely. It, you know what I mean? it, yeah, exactly, exactly. And, you know, um, considering my preparation for the game last night was four pints in the Howling Hops and very gratifying to see that seemed to be Arsenal's preparation for it too. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 think, I think I got to Stratford faster than any of our players moved last night. But um, as you can guess, and this perhaps leads me into the first question, Clive, which is really... Before we go into the nuts and bolts of the team uh, selection, and I think there's plenty of individual players to talk about and how far they're culpable. And, you know, when everyone has an off night, that suggests that maybe it's not just an individual thing. But let me tee up by giving you my emotional response to the yeah. game. And I was I was at the game and, um, you know, had some drinks beforehand, which clearly makes you a bit more emotional. But my kind of response to this was... I can't remember ever being this bothered, this annoyed by a League Cup game, probably since the 2018 final, and that's because that was a final. Usually, I am able to compartmentalise these games quite a lot. I, I do so think there's you? something in... What bothered you? So, what well, you? There's, there's one thing separate to the performance that bothered me, which is I... I th- I completely agree that like our season is not and is never going to be defined by the League Cup, almost never. And so I, I don't think it's necessarily like a big black mark on our season that we're out of it again. I do think last year I was, you know, my position last year, last season, I was um, F the Cups, basically. Didn't want to know about any of them. I was very open about that. I didn't think we had the squad and I thought we had a chance to do something in the league. This season, I think we've got the squad um, to take on the Cups a bit more. And I felt the team selection, for example, for this game, I was fine with it. It was rotated, but rotated to a high level. To me, it showed we have the squad to take on this competition. I'll tell you what bothered me about it, though. Not the elimination or even the result that much, but the manner of the performance, which for me was incredibly limp and I was sat very high up, very far back. Um, But at the same time, sometimes that gives you a perspective on the game, particularly when you're wearing incredibly bright kits. It really makes you stand out. And I saw, and Clive, I saw a lot of walking. I saw a lot of hands on hips. I saw a lot of chins, chins on chests and I saw too much walking. And this is the first time, I think since that Forest game, um, a couple of seasons ago, which was kind of immortalised on the All or Nothing documentary because Mikel Arteta, as we know, doesn't like losing duels. We lost pretty much every duel going in this game, I think. And this was the first time I walked away from a game and felt like, you know what? The effort wasn't good enough tonight. We've had off performances. We've had some this season. But this, to me, was... I felt that they didn't make enough effort for this game, whether that's intensity or effort, however you want to phrase it. I just don't think they tried hard hard enough. And I think that's worrying because I think elite teams never do that. Elite teams have off days, but they never leave you with the impression that they haven't tried hard enough. And that's what I came away with. What did you come away with? And do you agree or disagree with any of that? I can't. I can't disagree with it. And I was. I, I let you go there because I think when you've done the journey and got wet and st- stood there, and uh, you're in, you have a different emotion. And you feel it feels a bit more acute. You know, you know. I know it's like me. I've done a few, done a few of these trips, and you feel sort of a bit embarrassed by your, to, to how your team plays. Right? You don't like walking away, feeling like that. So, viewed from the city, you know, I mate generally. I really liked how we started the game. I thought we moved the ball well. 
I thought, oh, here we go. The rotation was nice. Um, I wasn't too. I never worry about teams with five subs anymore too much. I think the outcome. We can then talk about the team. But before the game, I tried to relax about it. And I looked at the team. I thought, oh, keep your playing as a central centre back in the three. I said, that's something that I wanted to see because I think he can pass it. I think he's quite, quite quick, and I think he's got that composure on the ball. So that was interesting. I wanted to see what Havertz played. Could he? Could he add the physicality in the centre of the pitch? Could he hold that team with with Vieira around and with Jorginho around, which I think you know they struggle with physicality. So that was something I was looking at. Obviously, post the weekend, Eddie's holding up the match ball. Where is he in his in his head? Where is he? And Trossard from the start is a different player from Trossard from one hour in. Right? Where is he? And obviously, we lost Smithro again. Problem. Every time we play a game, we lose a player. Problem. To your point about the squad, let's talk about that when we talk about rotation a little bit more. And then we got Nelson. Again, a player, a bit of a box of rebels player, let's be honest, and so is Eddie. You put your hand in, you're not sure what you're going to get out. Am I going to get an 8 out of 10? Am I going to get a 3 out of 10? We're not sure. And so I often, and the listener who knows me really, really well, they know I'm going to do this. They know what I'm going to say. The, f- the fundamentals of the game is the contest. And I started to watch a bit of that game this morning and I watched them put their shoulders on us in one-on-ones and push us to the ground. And they realized they were in charge of the contest. We are in charge of the ball, but they are in charge of the contest. And that is your one-on-ones. And then you look at your rotation and you realize we'd rotated away a lot of our physicality and dynamism and people that affect the game with their one-on-one ability, whether defensively or offensively. And therein lies the message from this game for me. We've potentially uncovered the weaknesses in our rotation squad. You know, and I think that weakness may be weakness, if that makes sense to him. You know, I felt we were a little bit weak. Yeah, absolutely. When you look at it, and, and again, I wasn't thinking this before the game or when I saw the lineup, nope. but in in retrospect, Jorginho Vieira Havertz, um, you know, it's it's not that physically imposing, is it? Uh, nope. You could probably do with with one other different model of player, and then you look up front, Eddie, like you said, and we, we'll go into we'll go into some individual performances, yep. um, and we'll we'll touch on Eddie a, a bit later, but. You know, if Eddie's not on it, you can't find him. If Havertz is not on it, you can't find him. And therefore, Trossard wasn't really there. Nelson wasn't really there. So I guess, like my other question, because if we take each player in turn, I think, and we'll talk about Kivior later, because I think he's the only potential exception. I think everyone was was off it, was below that. Everyone that started. That's what I tweeted as I came away from the ground. I said, every player that started that game, maybe I should have accepted Kivior there. I thought he was okay. But I said, every player that started that game played at an unacceptable level, as far as I'm concerned. So how? But how much do you think it was driven by dysfunction rather than maybe some individuals who, for whatever reason, just weren't at it on the day? If if I was doing one of my IRs, mate, from the ground, I would go for every single player because I think there's a story of the game through those individuals' eyes. I mean, it may be one to do, I don't know. But, you know, if you look at at our goalkeeper, I mean, he was fine. I watched him do the warm-ups. He looked really sharp. The first thing that happens that goes wrong, I felt we lost him a little bit. You know, I felt we lost his emotion a little bit. To the player that brought more of himself to our squad, more more of himself to our relationship with, with his back four, I felt we lost him. He was in that groove where everything went wrong. You know, Gabriel sh- doesn't block the shot through the legs. He gets a deflection and it, it makes him look stupid. And you think, crikey, where is his head at the moment? You know, if we look at Ben White, Warrior, that's his nickname. He wasn't in warrior mode last night. You know, thinking about the weekend and Seville next Wednesday. Injury is just like a cloud over this squad at the moment. We can't afford to lose too many more. There's too many important games, right? So, you know, Gabriel, he he plays the moment. Kivior plays the moment. They're fine. Zinchenko, 
when the way he played in midfield, I really liked it at the start. But then when he's pushed into the back line, we, got, we was in trouble, right? So there's some underlyings there that we all could talk about. If we're going to have our negative heads on. We can go through the whole team and say where well, they're not quite right. But the most important thing is your attitude to play. We've seen these very same players on other days in the league or in the European games when it really mattered, and they didn't move like that. They didn't tackle like that. They didn't pass the ball that slowly, and they weren't pushed off that easily. You know, and and so for me, it is around your approach to the game, and it's our fourth competition, and whether people like it or not, that's the truth. That is the truth. We have a two-legged semi-final. I'm watching Man City players in their best tuxedos at the Ballon d'Or tournament the, uh, presentation thing in uh, Paris this week, while we're preparing to play West Ham in, in the wind of rain. I, our Spurs got their legs up watching East Enders, then watching us. And I'm thinking, I, d- I don't want this in- imbalance. I want us to have the time we need. I don't want us worrying about injuries to certain players. I want us able to be competing for the stuff that really, really matters. I'm sorry if that doesn't match your view. I want Arsenal to win every game. But in the grand scheme of things, what matters are the lessons we learned about the players and the squad far more to me than the actual result. Yeah, and I guess we should point out, had we gone through in this game, it would have been Liverpool away in the next round in December. And then that would have been back-to-back games at Anfield. So we'd have played Anfield on the Wednesday night in the League Cup and then Anfield again on Saturday evening. Um, And as you say, I I think this is going to be the last year where it happens, but there'd be two uh, legs of a semi-final as well in January. And, uh, you know, I do agree, particularly when you get to January, you're likely to play a bigger team. You're likely to have to bring your big guns. Like Like I say, going out of the League Cup, even though to me it looks quite winnable, this year that doesn't bother me that much. It's it's more the kind of the performance, not even the result. If we'd got done 3-0 because we were 1-0 down and we were pushing at the end and we get done on the break, like I can live with that. That happened against Brighton last season. Like we were we were 2-1 down. They did us on the break for 3-1. Fair enough. Like we will go home and forget about it. But there, there was a limpness to this performance I didn't like. But I, I guess the other thing we should talk about as well is it wasn't just a case I don't think of Arsenal not really competing and Arteta said that he used the word compete and he used it very very advisedly I I liked I liked isn't the right word I appreciated his post-match comments that's what I wanted when I sent that angry tweet when I was walking away from the ground on 85 minutes you know I said that I felt like the players needed to be told and I kind of didn't doubt that Arteta would do that and he did and he did that thing where he said at the top it's my responsibility but then <laughs> you know he talked about I told them 48 hours before I told them about this and I do think there was the rice element as well for West Ham I don't think as much as this is their fourth competition this year as well I think you know I think that gave them maybe that little bit of extra motivation, that kind of, you know, we want to beat you uh, on yeah. your first game back here. and But at the same time, I do think there was a game state thing here where the first half was nowhere near as bad as the second half and West Ham were 1-0 up without having a shot. And that does then go on to have a knock-on effect on the rest of the game. So how much do you think kind of game state played into this um, in terms of it maybe also just being one of those days? Yeah, well, first goals really matter. I mean, look what we've seen with the the Manchester derby at the weekend. You know, that first goal, that first penalty. We saw it in the Merseyside derby. We saw it when we played Chelsea. First goals, they change everything. They make you make substitutions at different times. And you then become under question as as a coach and a manager. And so we were in total control of this game total control we don't quite get our line right on a, on the switchboard head it out for a cheap corner and they score off the corner with a foul that would have been stopped by VAR but no VAR in this competition <laughs> so you think you finally said hold on a minute they've not touched the ball and we're 1-0 down so then what happens then Tim what happens then is they score quickly after half time which allows them almost two free moments to win the game 
And then it's about how much do you want it, Arsenal? We know you're trying to go for the league. So we are going to be physical with you. And for you to overcome us, you're going to have to be physical with us. Do you really want to do that? Are you prepared to put yourself out to go and do that? Well, we were at Chelsea, weren't we? We we turned it on. Very similar, 2 nil down, we turned it on. Because that, that means something to us. And we should have won the game. Right, so a similar scenario here where we're being a bit outrun, being pushed around a little bit. They got two free goals and we did not have the answer. And that was what told me about the priorities. We didn't want to find the answer. And for me, the late substitutions were about minutes in legs to make sure we can have a, a day off and less running after the game to make sure we're ready for Friday's training and prep for Saturday's game. If anything, I'll tell to use this game as an absolute message to say, you want to trot up to Newcastle and don't want to put a tackle in, then that's not enough. Then that's not enough. And I think it was a, a really good reminder. We've lost two games this season, both been in the cup format, shall we say. And both of them, there's a level of, I don't care or we can recover it. Does that make sense? We can cover the position in the Champions League. So, I'm less concerned about this than I was, but I do. I, when we get to talk a bit deeper, Tim, I am concerned about the gaps that are appearing within the squad. Yeah, and clearly, like Arteta, we we all know, you know, it's almost a punchline, the kind of the standards thing. And although he rotates the team for the League Cup, which tells you how he regards it, at the same time, you know that he doesn't want to see half arseness. Um, yeah. in these games at all. As much as he can compartmentalise it, I I can tell he was annoyed by what he saw. But like I said, I just don't think, like, elite teams don't turn it off. At, like, you can't turn performance on and off like a tap. You can, like, intensity. I, I think you're right to point to the Lons game as well. This felt similar in the respect that it got away from us and we allowed it to get away from us. And perhaps... Um, you know, pending the result on Saturday, perhaps on a later pod, we might discuss some of that control versus threat kind of thing we've got going on. And um, I've just written a piece today based on uh, the the video you put up that John McKenzie did on TIFO, which I thought was yep. excellent about Great. how we're struggling in to create centrally. Uh, and I wrote my piece this week on the back of that that was basically about the dysfunction we have centrally, the, the fact we don't have established partnerships there yet and we're still figuring some players out. But let's let's go into um, some of the individuals. First off, Emil Smith-Rowe, not in the squad. Um, I did wonder why that was during the game because I fully expected him to start. Turns out he's injured. Uh, one Premier League start and he's injured. I mean, how much... Look, we, we don't really know enough at the moment, right? Could be unlucky. It could it could have been an injury that anyone could have got. But I I did sense the frustration in Arteta when he said it's going to be weeks. Like Gabriel Jesus, it's we're not putting a timeline on him. Partey Smith Rowe just says it's going to be weeks. O- almost with a an air of resignation. Like how let let me let me put the question a bit more provocatively. When you look at Thomas Partey and Emil Smith Rowe sitting on the sidelines again, does it cause you to revisit this idea during the summer that we absolutely weren't entertaining the idea of selling these players? I think we may have done. We, we're not too sure what what situation was regarding selling. And then, and there needs to be... Well, I think Arsenal basically said that Smith Rowe wasn't going anywhere. And Thomas Party, there may have been some sniffs in the market, but they seem to dissolve. Right, So... I can see a reason as to why they wanted to keep them. Um, but when they're sitting in the sideline, it's very easy to think, why didn't we sell them and get someone else in? And then we presume that person that comes in wouldn't be injured as well. That's what we do, right? We just assume that what's around the corner next door's garden is better than ours. Right? So I think the the miss of party and you tend to miss people on days like this, don't you? You know, when we were smashing people, we don't miss them. When you don't, when you look at the pitch and you're watching Edson Alvarez storm around and Suchek look like, you know, look like some Pavel Nedved in there. Do you know what I mean? And um, and Kudos, who I've watched in a lot of West Ham games, that's been okay 
have his breakout day against our midfield. You're thinking, I don't like this, you know? And I said that one of the earlier pods, and it's starting to come to fruition, Declan Rice left Paqueta to come and play with Jorginho. That isn't what he wanted to do. He wanted to play with a better player than that, you know? And that's no disrespect on Jorginho. For me, he's a squad player. But he must. I do not want the situation where Declan Rice is bowled into our team and is literally a, the best midfielder, without question, at this moment in time on form alone. And I'm looking around at a partner that he can play with with a level of physicality or playmaking or ball progression. And we are looking at Jorginho and El Nelly in behind because Thomas Pye is not available. That, to me, is a squad issue. It's a squad issue. And let's not let's just hope Declan Rice doesn't get an injury because he has now taken over the identity of our centre midfield, how we compete, how we drive, how we pass, where we pass, where we pass from. Back to John's video, where we pass from, inside or outside of the block. One of the big, that's one of my negatives, one of the big positives, that we got our skipper back. He came onto that pitch, Tim, you might be walking to the train station, <laughs> but he came onto that pitch and he was back. I still haven't seen the goal, put it that yeah, way. Yeah, he, he was back. He was literally back to himself. And yeah, it's very difficult when you're trying to, when you watch a player go through a little slump in form or injury, you sort of write them off and you forget how quickly they could come back. But he, he was back. And so, but that's something I knew would happen. What does worry me is how we partner Declan Rice in the centre of our midfield. And that is a debate. And the names in the frame are either untried or I'm not convinced by, or they're not convincing many of us. Yeah, that's that's one of the things I wrote about in this piece, actually, with Rice, that I'm kind of coming round to the idea that he's more of a granite jacker um, mm. than a than a Thomas Partey. A um, bit more ball dominant, maybe, than Xhaka was in that role. But it, it uh, you know, very much because like, the other thing that John kind of points out in the video is that Rice is not, for everything he is, he's not yet that kind of receipt from the centre-back turn punch the ball through the lines that's not who he is at the moment and actually I, I kind of think he is better sprinting outside of that block and that maybe Thomas Partey in the armchair just receiving turning punch through the lines and um, you know you mentioned Erdegaard there and his lack of form I don't think that that's a coincidence because you look through the team we've not really had Jesus up front we've not had Partey there and who's lost form Erdegaard and the next player I want to talk about is Zinchenko. Now, Zinchenko has gone very quick. I think this game, every element of this game is bad news for Zinchenko. The fact that he started it is bad news for him because to me that means he's not playing Saturday, that Tommy Asu is playing on Saturday. I'm fine with that, by the way. But a couple of months ago, we weren't in a situation where there are games where you don't play Zinchenko. Zinchenko was one of our always guys, and he's dipped to the hmm Newcastle away. We don't we don't want Zinchenko anymore. We want Tommy Asu, and the fact that he started this game to me means he's he's not in contention to start Saturday, and yet he still gets hooked on fifty seven minutes in this game, having been hooked at half time against Chelsea and. It really feels like this player is his status is falling, and that might be fine for the team. It might be that Declan Rice overtakes that, and maybe Rice and Tommy Asu on the left. Maybe that is something that needs to happen. That'll all come out in the fullness of time, I think. But I, I guess your impression of Zinchenko in this game, and yeah, that that sense that Tommy Asu is coming after him. Yeah, well, I. And he, and he and he will win that battle, as will Durian Timber, as will any other true defensive player that can play the ball in midfield as well. I think Jim Chanko is now in his mid twenties, and I've said this recently. If I'm him, I'm knocking on the manager's door and saying, "I'm always vulnerable to a kudos doing me on the outside, but in the interior, I can play with most teams in most teams." And I felt he was really obsessed with being inside, almost show he could play in midfield. 
And if I look at our ball progression at the moment, I look at him and think, I prefer you there inside, getting on the ball, showing personality, dominating, and also playing forward parties. But then not having to go back in and do the other job as well. So with Tommy Yasu there, I, I Tim, you know me, I'm I'm a pragmatist and I like my big fullback. So I like the team to be cradled by physicality. So what Pep did, I love it. Four centre backs or four big fullbacks, call them what you like. I like that. So the fact that Thomas Part is not playing at the moment, I think that's bad for Zinchenko because I think her physicality balance drops. So to retain that balance, you bring in a fourth stronger defender. And then you have the physicality in your back five unit. And so whether that's a 3-2, whatever you like, you've got the right balance there. Because Zinchenko is suffering for that. But that's okay. I would evolve him. I would evolve him further forward and I'd get him on the ball further forward. It isn't a problem. When you've got people in one dimensional, you can't do nothing with them. right? So the question is being there. And I'm not saying he should play left eight. I'm saying he should be at the base of our team without having to go back in and defend. you know. And he showed a lot of that good stuff in the middle of the pitch, earlier in the game, and the bad stuff was on the exterior. When he was on the back line, when he dropped in, when he had a dog leg in the back line on the first goal, which affected Gabriel. He was playing offside. He heads out for a corner. They get a cheap goal. These are the details that matter. So the closer he is to our goal, I don't like him. When he's in our interior, I think he's really untapped for Arsenal. Untapped ability. Untapped personality on the ball. Yes, he gives it away on occasion, but I want to tap into that. If we're giving it away there, we've got our four defenders behind him. I'm not too concerned. When he's making decisions on the edge of our box, like he did in the first few minutes at Chelsea, I am concerned because they are 18 yards from our goal. So that's what I'd like to see happen. While we have this issues for me with Party, Jorginho, I think he's not an every week player. I think he's a closer. And El Nenny is, is a, a squad player further down the list. So, we need to try something in there, mate, if I'm to be honest with you. And I think this is my biggest takeaway from the game. Yeah, that'd be interesting, actually. Like, is it an actual, like, Zinchenko-Rice kind of double pivot, um, perhaps with Erdegaard ahead of them? Maybe it could be Havertz on, a, on occasion ahead of them. And, and Havertz is the next player I kind of want to talk about because I, I'll be honest, again, I'm acknowledging the fact that I've put a fair bit of emotion um, into how I regarded this game and that can cloud judgment and everything yeah. like that. But this is the game <laughs> where for me, I'm beginning to turn on the habits thing. I've tried to be, you know, you know, that scene in the, the very famous scene at the end of Pulp Fiction where Samuel L. Jackson's like, uh, you know, be like the Fonzie. What's Fonzie? He's cool. Let's be cool. <laughs> I've tried to be cool about yeah. this and I've tried to be understanding and tried to think, well, okay, he's very different from Jacka. A lot of the mechanics, like we've just discussed in the center of the team, have changed and this player's not there and that player's not there. But th- this was a kind of game where I just thought, man, you've got to show something. Like, Stop sniffing around penalties like pity penalties. Like I didn't like that in the um, in the Sheffield United game where he was sniffing. I know he's quite a good penalty taker anyway, but he's yeah. sniffing around that penalty, and it's like, mate, have some shame. Mm. <laughs> like he, he's going to be taking them against Gunnosaurus at half time next time we play at home. Do you know stop what I mean? So he can. Stop it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but this was a night where it was just like. I, I was t- I was talking to a friend on the way home and I was like, the thing is for me with Havertz, he's not doing anything dreadfully wrong because he's not doing anything. Like he's eight foot four, dressed like a like a highlighter, and I still can't see him. I can't see him anywhere apart from getting pushed off the ball by like West Ham midfielders and I, I'm starting to worry now. Where where are you with this player and did did this do anything to alter your opinion? It, it did a little bit. And I think the fact I'm talking about moving our left back into midfield tells you what that there's a gap there, isn't there? That I'm not sure what we're going to get if we were to play him at the weekend. And I have been more sure than I was, than I am feeling today. I'm trying not to have conclusions because of the, because of the competition, 
because of the mixed relationships and because of how the game panned out with the goals conceded and the time we conceded them and how, how that affected our effort levels. And again, I thought he started the game really well. I really did. I thought he looked really good at the start. He had a really good flick header. I thought, oh, that's a good chance. I'm well done. You know, if that goes in, well, maybe we see him. But I'm wishing, I'm hoping, I'm wishing. And I'm just not sure what I'm going to get at the moment. And um, there was a game when he should have been the physicality. And he was for a period until the game went away. And then he stopped. And he wasn't the only one. And, and that that point you made there, Tim, about... Um, there's a day that comes when you suddenly will change an opinion. I had my, I had that day. Fine enough, not with Havertz, because I think there's still there's still some room to develop. There's still for room to develop into the squad. But I had that day with Vieira, funny enough, and and the reason why because he was in the position of choice, you know, and he's had enough time to have a look at how that position works for us and the ball dominance required and how we get confidence from touches and passing and moving. And I just didn't feel that was what we saw enough, you know? And um, and I don't mind if you're lightweight. Honestly, it didn't bother me. But then you must be ball dominant. You must be a, a marathon runner. You must get on it. You must go to it when rather than find yourself in a space where you can't be found. So I lost a bit of patience there. You know me, I'm really patient. You know, I'll always find something positive to say. I lost a bit of patience there. Again, it's not the result. It's I want the levels to come up. And so I want to know when they come on the pitch that the levels are going to be there. I don't care about the result. The result will take care of itself if our levels are up. But when you have an opportunity to start a game, you've got to bring your levels. You've got to bring them. And know particularly for those who are not playing every week. So I, I can forgive Ben White because he's playing Saturday. Right? I can forgive him and he's got a track record of delivering. Right? But Vieira was building his trust levels with with the fans and with the manager and and have us up to, up to the same point as well. And they didn't take the opportunity to build trust. And to build trust, you have to apply yourself. You have to almost over-apply yourself. And I felt is opportunity missed for both of them. Yeah, definitely. And uh, again, like with Havertz in particular, I, it, it feels very Ozil where we're talking about body language and things like that. And clearly, mm. like he's a guy who doesn't give off a lot body language wise. And we know he can be physically imposing. He can, you know, win his duels and all of that and good in the air and everything. But like, there's something inside you and some of us try to quiet the voice more than others, yeah. but there is just something inside you in the back of your neck that goes, mate, just kick someone or something yeah. or like show that you understand that this is not going well and don't show it by sniffing around penalties when we're three nil up, yeah. like a, like about, a mascot who's, <laughs> how about who's should won be a competition. At, he should be playing at Newcastle with the injuries that we have. In, in that interior. He should be playing at Newcastle. He should be playing. That's it. Now, I said those words out loud. Do you think he will be playing at Newcastle in midfield or at the forward, or is he going to be on the bench? And we don't know. And no one can tell me that he must play because he hasn't yeah, yeah. done enough. And that's the difference. And I'm, I'm, It's a wish. Yeah. I, I hope he plays. I hope he plays well. I hope he plays a position that suits him. I'm not sure what that is, but I'm wish-casting it. Do you see what I mean? I want to be more certain. I'm pretty confident I'm going to get from Rice. I'm pretty confident I'm going to get from our two 22-year-old runners on the outside. I've got a box of rails that's in the forward in Eddie at the moment. I'm, I'm sorry, that's the truth. And, and we've got a couple more like that. And, and that's, I promise you, mate, I promise you, I'll tell you, it's having that conversation with those guys today, tomorrow, and those standards will be up at the weekend because that, that, that just won't do. That won't do. Yeah, and that, I guess that's the other thing that's frustrating with Havertz as well. It's like there is a spot in the team for you there. The guy left in Granite Xhaka, like it's 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 too simplistic to say it's an open goal because you still got to go and perform. But mm. you're not competing with people for that spot. It was you started in it on the first game of the season. It's yours. It's yours to lose, and go you've lost it. it. Go get it. Grab exactly. It. You know, make and, it a non-debate. You know. 
Yeah. And and even and even with that, now the centre forward's out. And like you said, and we'll come on to Eddie now because it's a good segue, but like you said, Eddie veers wildly between eight and three out of ten. So there's there's even another spot. It's it's like he's missed the penalty and the rebound has come straight to him. <laughs> And I know I appreciate he didn't really play up front last night other than like the last little bit, but there's another spot in the team for him and he's not really grabbing it. But let, let's talk Eddie, who played up front, like you said, got the match ball on Saturday, you know, after a pretty insipid substitute display in Sevilla, then Emirates, you know, against Sheffield United, bangs a hat trick, lovely goes to West Ham and someone pointed out that he hasn't scored, I think, for 18 or 19 away games now. What's your assessment of this player's inconsistency, why he doesn't do it away from home and just what you felt watching him in this match? Yeah, I mean, Eddie's put me in the uh, analysis grave many times because every time I I've think, well, that's it, he's nowhere... He does something amazing. I mean, and there are games I remember, the United game, obviously Spurs away last year, where I didn't think he had that in him. You know, and coming on at Fulham, I thought, wow, here he is, he's arrived. And then we go to Seville and, and mate, he was close to a sub-sub out there. You know, and then he comes on Saturday. I'm, I didn't go for him because I, I don't go for people anyway. But but like, I'm thinking in, inside, I'm conversation to myself thinking, mate, Eddie, that, that was rubbish. You you gonna be nowhere near it on Saturday. Comes out Saturday, Sheffield Wednesday, like he's running on air. Sheffield United, sorry, like he's running on air. Looked amazing. Scores his goal, centre laces, everything perfect. I'm thinking, well, you've been trusted. You're Arsenal centre forward. You started eight or nine games for us this season. Let's go. Let's go to West Ham and show what we've got. Nothing. I mean, nothing. I don't know where he was playing. You couldn't find him at any point in that game. Any security. Everything was late. All of the positive attitude that he showed at the weekend just wasn't there. Now, we know he can play. He's got an England cap on his fireplace, right? So we know he can play. So there's no debate there. But you, you can't have that. You can't have that. You can't have that three out of ten. You, you just can't. Because they, they, they're they centre backs, mate. They didn't have to clean their boots after the game. They just put them down there for the weekend, right? So um, there was just no drama to them at all, at all. And you got to have a little level of um, personal pride about your game in that regard. I just want him to find a level so we can go to these... We got an away game on Saturday, and I'm now worried. That tweet came out about that scored in 18 games. I wish I hadn't read it, because now I'm thinking, what are we going to do the weekend? You know, unless... Jesus has a miraculous recovery. What are we going to do at the weekend? You know, playing against solid centre-backs at Newcastle that are going to make you feel your calves after a challenge. Will Eddie bring that Eddie that we know is in there, but we're just not sure where it's going to come out. And um, So I'm staying away from my Eddie analysis because he's done me loads of times. I've, I've, I've killed him, and then he's like gone and done something amazing. And when he does something like last night, I just stay quiet because I think I know who the player is. I think I know where his level is. But he also has the ability to massively surprise on occasions. And so I just hope it's at the weekend. Is there um, any, I guess, caveat in that? For, I mean, first of all, there, there are two things around this. I think the, neither of the wide players, I thought they were both rubbish as well, <laughs> to be yeah. honest. Yeah. But let's first, maybe keeping it with Habits and Inketia. That to me seems like a really unsatisfying mix. Yeah. Um, and if I could give Havert, if there's one glimmer of hope for me for Havertz in that left eight role, I mean, I, I don't really want a 65 million Goldilocks player where everything has to be just right. But if there's one glimmer of hope, it's that maybe him and Jesus can provide yeah. some kind of complementary partnership. And we haven't seen Jesus up front enough this season, but. There's something about, you know, like when kids are naughty at school or like there's a kid that's not that naughty, but you put him together with his mate and they're, they're both a nightmare. Yeah. That That's kind of like Havertz and Nketiah to me. They seem to bring out the worst in one another or there's just not a good mix there. Like, what do you make of of 
those two as a pairing, I guess. Yeah, it doesn't take much to think that the way Jesus plays, I mean, we've last seen play tackling at left back. <laughs> so, I mean, the way he plays, the way he drops in, the way he recognises when to drop in, it's really part, big part of how we play, you know, and how he separates from his defenders, where he finds himself. He's a nightmare to play against. But you could see that Havertz, if he's smart, could use Jesus to find his position. So where Jesus, if he comes close to him, he should disappear to his starting spot. And then he becomes a forward immediately, which he's wired to do. Right, So he's almost getting them on the piston almost. Because Jesus loves that left-hand side for the Martinelli link. So you could see, it doesn't take much to work that one out, does it, Tim, to be honest, that he could drop in, he could get on the piss, and suddenly he's at centre forward, suddenly he's a, he's a target for the second phase. So when Jesus drops in, don't stand there watching him, disappear. Disappear into forward areas, and as we progress the ball, you become a, a threat in the penalty box. So we haven't seen that at all, really, and Eddie holds that space between the centre-backs. So it doesn't leave room for Hazards, Havertz to crash as much, because Eddie moves for himself around the box. He doesn't move with a partner in mind or somebody else. He doesn't run for somebody else, that makes sense. He'll run for himself. He won't do what Jesus did the other week, where he just takes three or four people away. I can't remember the exact game. I've lost it, sorry. So someone else can receive a pass and score. That's not Eddie's game. He's a, he's a, he's a goal-scoring centre-forward. That's absolutely fine. We have different styles, right? So that one link is something that, I'm with you. That's the thing that hopefully will bring out the player that I think Arteta thinks he signed. But I can hear people listening to their devices now saying, "It ain't gonna work, Clive. You're trying too hard to make it work. <laughs> <laughs> ain't gonna work, Tim. Just leave it, mate. It's, it's not happening." <laughs> but I, that I have that hope with you, Tim. I really do. Yeah, yeah. It's um, it, it's actually um, slightly reminiscent, I think, of what's happening in the women's team at the moment, where they've got a striker in Russo who does like brilliant work away from the box. Yeah. And what Arsenal have struggled with is who goes into the box when she comes away from the box, and that that that's where there's a there's a role for Havertz, I think, just like you said, like Jesus is. And, and this is why I have some optimism about that potential partnership. Havertz and Inketia, they both want to disappear. Jesus is the opposite. Jesus, he loves crowd scenes. Look at his finishing. Yeah. Put no one in front of him. He can't finish for Toffee. Put three players in front of him. He'll bang it in the top corner. He likes crowd scenes. He likes contact. He wants two or three players in his way, either to dribble around them or smash into them. And Havertz wants the opposite. Havertz and Inketia together, they both kind of do that Homer yeah. Simpson disappearing into the hedge thing. And and I kind of think that's why they're a, they're a bad mix. But, you know, so those two, you know, naughty children together bringing the worst out of one another. We also had Trossard and Nelson out wide. I thought they were both terrible, um, really, really bad. And But I guess when every one of your front four individually drops a stinker there's there's probably something else going on there but what what did you make of kind of Nelson and Trossard in those wide positions I mean I'm I'm guessing you're not going to sit there and tell me that they play brilliantly but was <laughs> no was there something about that collective or was it that just all four of them just didn't bring it so yeah, they were, they were part of the passing machine in the first half, receiving the ball, to recycling it, not really threatening on occasion. Nelson, a couple of half chances, mostly on his left foot. And to be honest, he's a he's a left sider coming on his right foot. So he was doing what was on offer to him. They were showing him inside onto his weak foot and and we saw what happened, right? So Trotsar's a bit of an enigma, isn't he? Because at the weekend, he was like snake hip, super sharp. Couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it. You're thinking, this guy's got to play, got to play. Gets a chance on the start, again, okay in the first half, but just not strong enough. Not strong enough and not has it, didn't have enough relationships around around him, really. So a really, really quite disappointing from a overall game performance thing. But I will, I will say again, the second goal after half time almost makes the rest of the game null and void because it, it just kills it dead, really. And, and so... I don't want to judge too much on the and again on the early part of the game. I thought he was bright until the game. The goals just changed 
our mindset completely. Yeah, I, I think that's the thing as well on the night, whether it was a physicality thing or a mentality thing or a little bit of both. We just didn't have those players on the pitch who, when you're 2-0 down, will go and get you the game back. Um, I think it's telling that Declan Rice was the first player to come on because that's what he did against Chelsea, right? The game got away from us and he went and fetched it back. Yeah. Um, and perhaps we didn't have those players. Again, Tim, we don't want to... We were... We're starting to get like this collective group we've seen this year. And there were key people we lost at the end of last year, Sleeper being one, maybe Pi was me another. The year before it was Tierney. You know, we we had these key pillars. And I was starting to think, naively, that <laughs> that the key pillars were weren't so obvious. But they suddenly look obvious again, don't they? They the mm. pillars in this team that give other players confidence to perform are staring at you. You know, they're just suddenly staring at you. And the best of Arsenal, when those pillars are there, we are, we have got an incredibly high ceiling because when Sleeper plays, Gabriel's better. Ben White's better. You know, Ramsdale's a bit of a dip on this day, but I'll give him a break. It's not, it's not important. He's been crushed by the whole situation, right? So, um, and then, you know, with Sleeper playing, our playmaking from deep, is better so there's less responsibility on the centre midfielder because the guy just runs everything from there then we have got a centre midfielder who can crash everything off the ball made our off the ball play look amazing he just sweets everything up delivers ball he's learning to pass down the middle as well he's whipped it around the corner he's doing everything he shouldn't be doing everything for Arsenal Football Club that shouldn't be happening that's an issue Saka, mate, Saka, I know he's on, only on for a few minutes, but he's got feet to die for. So smart, Nelly. The level of these guys, so the guy. These are pillars. These are superstar players on new contracts, superstar wages. These are pillars of our team. And so when you have an opportunity to go out there and show that you can influence a game, and then you, who are not normally a pillar, be a pillar on a certain day, you have to take the opportunity. Because now, as fans, we are now recognize who those pillars of our team are and we are now worried about them if they ever break down or fall down because we'll be back where we are and so it's a real message to those people just on the edge you've got to show you've got to show even when some of the strength of the tent isn't there you know what i mean you've got to show you've got to hold a tent up don't be happy being the shortest pole in the tent be the longest pole in the tent hold the tent up put your hand up and say i'm here for a reason and this is why don't disappear when the, when the moment really matters. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you referred to Ramsdale there. There's two more um, kind of performances I wanted to go into, really. Um, I, I guess with Ramsdale, whether it's the performance or the situation or a little bit of both, I suspect a little bit of both. I mean, clearly he's in a situation now where he doesn't get many opportunities <laughs> to impress and you know he got a fabulous reception from the away end which is like absolutely right i you know the the player clearly needs lifting he's a popular player it's very worthwhile showing him he's a popular player as well i, I have to admit i feel like it's gone a little bit Raya versus ramsdale um you know and, and i don't want to do that no. um either but it, it does i mean put let me put it this way right let me put it bluntly and then get it out of the way because I don't really want to propagate the idea that we have to take a side and that they're yeah. banging up against each other but if, if Raya concedes that third goal I think they're a chance of Aaron Ramsdale from the away end yeah. um, as, as much as I, I can see how and why he conceded it but what struck me in this game I, I think there's caveats on on the goals for him yeah. even if Overall, I think the third one he should save, but I think the deflection makes it less of a makes it makes it maybe an error, but not a clangor. But one one of the things that did strike me about his performance in this game, you could see he was trying to do more of the the Raya stuff, right? He was trying yeah. to do more of that. He wasn't just going long all the time. He was like baiting the press and all of that. Um, wh whether that was by instruction or whether that's because he sat on the bench and said, why am I not in this team? It's because Raya's doing that stuff and I wasn't doing that stuff. So I've got to go and do that stuff. Like, what what did you make of the evening for him? Because I think however you sympathetically you look at it, 
there's no question Raya's starting on Saturday. Like he didn't do anything that makes you think he's getting the shirt back. No, and I think um I, I, I felt Ramsdale should have started at Sheffield Sheffield United, by the way. I think he should have started on Saturday. And that would have got him ready for this game, you know? And but hey look, I it's take it took me a while to accept it, Tim. You've been there sooner than me. <laughs> you said uh Ray is now number one. I've been looking at this and saying, look, goalkeeper position has got room for evolution, how we look at it. I understand what he's saying. What he said hasn't come to fruition yet um, because he just hasn't. And now in a situation where Ramsdale just had his first baby, life is different. Emotionally, emotionally yesterday, it didn't feel quite right to me. And that could be me just looking. I've got sympathies with him. He didn't feel quite right. On all the goals, I can explain every single one. I, I think he's incredibly unlucky in all three of the goals. Gabriel normally would fly out and press much closer. Decided just to press with a weak body shape and it goes through his legs. The one place where he can't get it. You know, on the, on the, on the second goal. The third goal, Kivio, just stay out of the way. Don't, just don't put your legs out. Deflection and it goes in. Looks really bad. And the first goal's a foul, right? What good one good one on one save. I was never worried about his distribution, if I'm honest with you. I know he can do it, but it's the comfort by which he did it that was starting to edge a little bit, you know? And then when Raya comes in against Everton and he looks so comfortable, you're thinking, oh crikey, that's you're you're in trouble, mate. Do you know what I mean? And you're in trouble. But then Raya started to look uncomfortable. So people say, Hold on, Ramsdale looked a little bit uncomfortable on occasion, and Raya looks uncomfortable on occasion. So why not just why can't you have one come play? That doesn't seem to be the situation. And now I, I'm accepting that Raya is the number one. But that's, that's my journey, I'm afraid. <laughs> People are going to say, I was there ages ago. You were definitely there ages ago. And, it, and he looks like number one now. And last night convinced me. And that probably totally unfair, but just where I am with it. Yeah, and I, I guess what I, you alluded to it there, like Ramsdale, either emotionally or comfort-wise. What, again, I, I don't think it was like a disastrous display from him at all, but he's not going to get many chances to impress and, and he probably didn't really take it on balance. But you alluded to the fact that Reyes started to look a little bit uncomfortable and part of my theory around that is overthinking. And maybe some of that's the yeah. pressure, maybe some of that's the what am I in the team to do? It's this, I must do it at all costs. And then Ramsdale comes in and maybe he's not himself in terms of his distribution. He's trying to be, it's a bit cool runnings, you know, yeah. <laughs> trying to be uh, David Raya. And and I wonder, do you think, and I look, I've rejected this during the time, but I have to ask the question, do you think the situation has unnecessarily created discomfort for both goalkeepers now? The word unnecessary is an interesting one, Tim, because I think there are, we have two signings. We're all happy with Timber, although he's not here anymore. <laughs> We're all happy with Rice. We wish we had a couple more like him, basically. Um, the other two signings in Havertz and, and Raya could be described as unnecessary. Do you see what I mean? And when a manager takes a decision which you not may not understand fully, but you feel it's unnecessary, and when you see other people that you've got used to not either not be at the club being sold or somebody being pushed down from being number one to number two, you're then in a situation as a manager where you, you almost have to reconvince people why you've made this decision and the player's performance needs to be where it needs to be for it to people to recognise that it was a necessary move to raise our standards. Right? So with the Raya conversation, he's been here a while. He knows the league. He will reach the standard. He will reach the standard. He gets more comfortable playing for the club. He will reach the standard. Whether Ramsdale will overcome him, I'm I'm not so sure. But Raya will reach the standard. Now, Havertz now is slightly different, where he's had a period where he was at a standard and he had a dip, and we've paid money for him, and he needs to reach the standard because he has a key role in the squad. So that word unnecessary is key because what that does is that then puts a manager on the question. You only got to look at your Twitter to see that people are starting to question a few things. It's only a bit of a reaction to the grief reaction to a defeat. But when you do things that are deemed unnecessary they need to be made to feel important they need to be made necessary and important 
we can see our off the ball stuff with Havertz is better. We can see some of our control distribution from the back is better. But it needs to manifest itself. So when we lose, people then question, does this need to happen? And to see Ramsdale a little bit crushed yesterday, he looked at that to meet him where I was seeing, makes you think, oh, that doesn't feel right. That doesn't feel right to me. We've lost somebody. Or you want to be gaining people in the squad, not losing people because they feel that maybe it's a maybe it's an unfair fight. Yeah, definitely. And I and I'm thinking as well about like uh Tommy Asu at the moment. And you know, I said right off the back of the timber injury, this is a big opportunity for him, because if Timber's still around, I I don't know where Tommy Asu is at the moment, but he's got his opportunities and he's he's really taking them. Um and and so, yeah, I, I do think there's something there. When you do the, like, we, we've both seen during our time as fans, like those quote-unquote unnecessary signings. And, you know, you think of bringing in Ian Wright when Alan mm. Smith just won two golden boots. I mean, Ian Wright blew that out of the water by scoring, shed loads of goals. Or when David Seaman comes in for John Lukic, again, like no one agreed with that at the time, but David Seaman just removes all doubt and you go, ah, oh, okay, that's fine actually. And I actually used the example, I think, with Paul the other day of Alan Ball. After we won the double, we bring in Alan Ball, who's the best ball-playing midfielder in the country. You can see exactly what the thinking was. All right, we're a tough, disciplined team. We need to add a little little bit of sparkle in there. Didn't work at all. Just didn't yeah. work um, for one free. reason or another. Yeah. <laughs> um, so like th- those things happen sometimes, even the ones that make sense on paper just don't turn out like that. Um, the, the last player I want to discuss before we finish is uh, Kibio. You uh, mentioned there about Ramsdale, he should have been given the Sheffield United game and perhaps if you're backing up two performances and perhaps even if you just have the security of the Sheffield United game where you're watching it, <laughs> like Raya and Ramsdale both sat and watched it basically. It's just one watched it from his 18-yard area and the other one watched it on the bench in a tracksuit. Yeah. But someone who did get the Sheffield United game and then got this game on the back of it was Kivior. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that he looked like the, like, you know, the second coming of Bobby Moore or anything. But on the night, if I was to say there was one of the starting players who I would excuse from my, my little tweet sent on 86 minutes, it was probably Kivior. What did you make of his display and are we, you know, to your point about finding players, are we finding a player there? Oh, without a doubt, we're finding him. And he's starting to add the things that he was adding earlier on. He's starting to be more aggressive. I think he won all his aerial duels. He was really aggressive in the air. He was front-footed. He can pass the ball like a bullet. He always could. You know, he can switch it six yards if you want to. He's got a real range. He looks, when he runs, he's running fast, but if you watch him run, he's got a bit of a low knee lift and you think, is he going to get there? He's going to get there, but he's quick. I, but he's also young. There was a ball down the line in, I think it might have been the second half, and he he wins the race easily and he just heads it out for a throw. right? So, But he had the speed to just go back to the keeper, switch, split, and then get the ball back again. And that just tells me that's an experience thing. Do you know what I mean? This is, mate, you've got it. You're at this level, you know, and you've got the chance to just keep that ball for the team. Don't give them a throw. This is West Ham. They want the throws into the box. Do you see what I mean? And so, um, and so they've made 60 yards of territory. That will come with experience of playing in the league and he'll trust his ability because he's got a lot of ability. Another player that spent time in the back three, playing for Spezia, back three in the centre and the left, he plays left back for Arsenal and he plays left back for Poland on occasion. And he's also spent time in centre midfield. That to me is smart, smart recruitment. Have a player like that. And he's starting to look like an Arsenal player. And the more physical he gets, the more experience he gets. I think we found something there. And again, his multi positional part of his game, his versatility, sorry, means that no one person is boxing that at the team. You know, at the weekend, he might end. We might end in the back five. He will come on. He'll be the first guy to come on. You know, and um, so yeah, I think he's becoming really important in the squad. I'm really pleased. I didn't want to see him go on loan. There was rumours of him going to Sevilla on loan to start the season. I'm so glad he hasn't gone. I think he's going to be very important in our team. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, th- I think one of the kind of few, uh, it might be a stretch to call it a bright spot, but he wasn't shit, uh, yeah. <laughs> which put him in a category of one, I think, to be honest. Uh, just before we get out of here, clearly Newcastle away on Saturday. This looks like a tougher game to me than it did 48 hours ago because I was reading all about how Newcastle have got injuries. They've got a massive Champions League game on Wednesday night. All of a sudden, we've been done three nil in the cap. Well, sorry, three one in the Carabao Cup. I- I'm still psychologically three nil because that's when I left the stadium. <laughs> Newcastle's B team have gone and rolled over Man United three nil in the Carabao Cup Saturday evening game. Um, you know there are uh, storms in England <laughs> at the moment, so it-, it feels like every game is played in a storm at the moment <laughs> for Arsenal, except yeah. Sheffield United. Um, what I'm not going to ask you like to pick a team or anything, but what are the attributes that you would prize in the team selection here? You referenced Havertz up front. Is that because you're thinking of going over the top of the Newcastle press? What what would you like to see Arsenal prioritise in terms of their game plan? Yeah, I, I have a. This may change, by the way, <laughs> but I I think it's to have the ability to find somebody and centre forward is a priority for me today after I've just watched a game where we couldn't find a centre forward. This could change when the when the emotion goes away. But so, yeah, I think that could be the option. I, I, but I do worry about our, our partner for rights and I think we need to do something there. I, w- I would like to see a change there. But I'd like to see Havos play a centre forward. Because what he does is when you're in a cauldron, you have direction. And that direction is important, you know. So when you've got your head down and you're being pressed off the ball, Newcastle are an athletic team. They made eight changes yesterday and still went to Man United and were strutting around. So I do feel we are. I was thinking we were playing them at a good time. We took a bit of a kick here and a bit of a slap emotionally. But I do think it's going to give us a chance to reset, you know, draw a line in this. So, yeah, I think... I think we'll be. I genuinely think we're okay. My only worry, Tim, is the centre midfield. That's that's my worry. We're going to have to do something there, make a change. For me, I feel that's our that's our potential weakness. I was watching Joe Willock yesterday run through and slot the goal. I'm not sure if you've seen it yet. And when Joe Willock left Arsenal, we were playing a stick a stick on four two three one with Emil mm-hmm. Smith Rowe playing in the ten on occasions, and Joe Willock didn't really have a role. We weren't playing with three eights per se. And now we play with, with eights. And I was watching Joe Willett run through <laughs> and slot the ball into the bottom corner like he was going pop into shots for a pint of milk. I'm thinking, that player suits our team more now than when he left. You know, the team has evolved to his box-to-box, hard-running, hard-shooting skills. What are we asking Havertz to do? Box-to-box, hard-running, arrive in the box. You know? It's really interesting the game, how it evolves, right? So watching him do that, just for us, will rock up at the weekend. It's a little bit concerning. <laughs> um, Joel Linton, a, a monster athlete. We're going to have to compete with them, but we can. We can. We have got the players, but we've got to bring the mindset. We've got to bring the mindset. Yeah, and what's interesting last season was, I don't know if you remember, Jorginho got man of the match. We decided this was a Jorginho game yeah. when we went there in April because almost a bit like our approach to the Everton game at Goodison, where we were like, okay, let's not bash the ball up in the air against these guys. Let's keep it on the floor. And almost the same with the thinking behind starting Jorginho in April. It was, okay, let's not just try and compete with them physically. Let's just make sure they can't get the ball. So they run themselves out. And that, 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 again, that was, that just kind of showed a little bit of what we've seen this season with a bit of a horse horses for courses approach with our with our kind of midfield depth. But yeah, I, I'm guessing that maybe you wouldn't start Jorginho in this one. Well, again, we have our we have our blind spots and our biases. And when I see Jorginho being run past by Paqueta last night about four or five times, I have these scars on me today. You know, I've got Eddie <laughs> scars today. You know, I've got Vieira scars today. They'll they they'll be gone by tomorrow, and I'll be thinking of ways to get them, you know, to get them back in the in the group. But I have these scars today, and I don't want to see that. I don't want to see us getting run past in the middle of the pitch, you know. But Declan Rice wasn't there when this was happening, right? So, and and Sleep wasn't there to step up and go and take it, you know. So there are reasons for this. And if we retain the ball better up top, and suddenly they're not 
running through us on a transition. So there, there are reasons for it, and then more than just one player. So we have we can do the old go backwards fifteen times, keep the ball, or we could say, nah, we're going to play where you don't want us to play. We're going to play right up there. So which Arsenal's going to show? You know, which one's going to show this time? I want to see us go get them. You know, even in that game, I, I didn't watch that Newcastle game live. Well, the only game I didn't see live last year from uh, even on TV, I saw it afterwards. And but the feeling I got from rewatching it was we were doing fine. They were really in it, but we scored an amazing opening goal, which justified yeah. our play style. You know? Yeah, yeah. And so I'm not convinced that was the right way to go. The Newcastle had a number of chances before half time, after half time. They yeah. goes in. They had a penalty different. overturned, wasn't it? Yeah, by VAR. exactly, yeah. exactly. So they were all over us. They were after us. They were running at us. They, they fancied themselves physically against us, and they were after us. They were after our boots, mate. And so I would rather go over and play four and four at the back. I would rather control six and four rather than five v five. I would go over and I would make sure we get the ball and we start to control it there with Odegaard, Havertz, Saka, and Martinelli. And I'd say, right, we're coming for you with this four. Do you fancy it? That's what I would do. But they have to be, we need that facilitation in the centre and we need that one-on-one on the outside. And they will be, apart from Havertz, they will be fresh. They will be fresh and ready to go. So that's what I would play where our fresh talent is and not at the base of our team. Yeah, 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 good point. Like, it's it's more the front five that, that are going to, yeah. you know, the back five might stop us losing it, but the front five are going to have to go and win it for us. And to your yeah. point, that's what happened last season, right? I think it was Erdegaard scored and then we get an own goal, but it's because Martinelli sprints with the ball about 40 yards and it's those kind of individual moments. And that's what Arteta spoke about after Sevilla as well. He kind yeah. of made that point, you know, you, control, et cetera, not doing anything silly, but your players have got to go and win it for you at some point. Yeah, so I, I think we have the talent to do that so long as we don't do what we did in this game and just give them stuff um, for free. So, yeah, uh, that's, that's I think, going to be a, a very nervous, tetchy game. There's something about it being on a Saturday evening as well that I, I don't like and I can't really put my finger on why. Are you going, um, are you going but, there? I, I'm not, no, All no, right. no. The women's game is the next day at 12.30 All right. um, and it would have been complicated to get back. So uh, well, I'm not on this occasion. place anyway. If you go out in Newcastle, you're, not, <laughs> you're never getting back to wherever you need to go to. So uh, I, yeah. I've done that many, many times. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this is the first time I'm not going in quite a while. So <laughs> yeah, but um, we'll talk about that game. I might well be on the instant reaction for that since I won't be at the game. Um, but for now, Clive, Thanks very much. Thank you very much. And we'll be back. Yeah, with a, I, I'm not sure whether we'll do anything on Friday. Patreon flavour. We'll have an instant reaction to the game on Saturday evening, which will be out for you to listen to. You know, within about 90 minutes of the final whistle, and then we'll do a main pod as ever on Monday. And Elliot will probably be back for all of that. Um, I think he's just taking a day off um, because the team did on this occasion, but. Uh, thanks very much for for listening and we will speak to you as ever after Newcastle nil, Arsenal 10.